Hi everybody, you IBHL students. Sorry I'm not with you today. Got a touch of the flu I caught the other day, so I'm uh, going to take it easy and sit at home. But anyway, um, while the other class is working on their Pogel activity, uh, you guys should have the uh, note sheet for 10.1. So as I mentioned to you last time, in HL we're going to get into the idea of meiosis a little bit more in detail. So last time we learned the basics of meiosis. And this time we're going to kind of look at each stage a little more in detail. So let's just review uh, what we learned last time. So meiosis is similar in some senses to mitosis. It has the same four steps, which are prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. One of the differences, of course, is that you have two cycles in meiosis. And the reason that happens, of course, is that you're going from a diploid situation. So we start up here in diploid, and then we're going to eventually end up with haploid. So with humans, if we have two sets of 23 chromosomes, 46 chromosomes diploid, by the end of it, we would make gametes, which we know as sperm and eggs, and those would be haploid, so they'd only have 23 chromosomes, right? So you have two different divisions. Here's the first, and here's the second here, okay? So we start off like we always did in interphase, and you remember the phases of interphase, G1, S, and G2. Essentially, uh, it is in the interphase S where DNA is replicated. So when you see chromosomes that kind of look like Xs, those have already been replicated. If you look over here, you can see what happens when they're not replicated. So that's where they started, right? But after replication, they have two sister chromatids, which are connected by a centromere. And then we go through the two phases or stages of uh, meiosis. And the interesting thing about it is what happens in the two different stages. So let's start off by reminding us what happens from start to finish. As I said, we go from diploid to haploid, okay? We go from one cell to actually four cells which is interesting, so one to four. Later on, we'll talk about how this differs in male sperm and female eggs. The other thing that happens is that there is a variation that takes place. So the cells at the end are not exactly the same, or another way of looking at it is they don't exactly look like the original cell here. So there's variation in sexual recombination. That's one of the reasons that it takes place there. This can happen because of the way the chromosomes line up. So you can see here, just randomly, for example, we have two sets of chromosomes. The blue lines up this side. The blue lines up the other side here. So they're going to separate differently. It didn't have to be that way. It's random. There's a 50-50 chance how chromosomes could line up. And if we have 23 chromosomes, the possibilities would be 2 to the power of 23. That's a lot. But the other thing that happens here is that we could have recombination events, and that takes place in prophase one. And I think if you look really closely here, the blue and the orange, it looks like little pieces happened in a crossover event. So that also makes variation. If this all seems really confusing to you, the one thing to remember is, in the first stage of meiosis, you still have homologous chromosomes. There are pairs of every chromosome. So they can pair up then. But when you get down here to uh, meiosis 2, there are no longer homologous pairs, so you can't have pairing up at the equator during meiosis. Okay, so big picture. Meiosis is a reductive division of the nucleus to form haploid gametes, and gametes are sperm and eggs. Let's start at the beginning, interphase. That's where DNA replication took place. So you can see here that these chromosomes have already been replicated, right? Now, they are exactly identical on the sister chromatids. But I want you to remember, if we look at this pair of chromosomes, so the big one and the big one, right? They all have the same genes on them. So let's suppose these little bands here are genes, for example. They have the same genes, but... Remember, you could have different varieties of the gene, and we call those varieties alleles. They might be the same. We'll talk about that later on, but they might also be different. 
So there is some variation that's already in the chromosomes here. And the two sister chromatids are held together by a centromere. So this would be a homologous pair of chromosomes. This is before replication is taking place. But you can see the allele here is the same as the allele here, but the allele here is not the same as this one. These two are the same. These are different. These are different. And when we get into our study of inheritance in genetics, we'll understand why this is important. Now they've been replicated and they're held together here by a centromere. This happens in the S phase. Okay? And now we have not increased the number of chromosomes. You still have two chromosomes here, but we've doubled the amount of DNA because each chromosome has two sister chromatids. Okay? Now, we go to prophase one. Now, a lot of people get this confused, but recombination, or what we're going to call a crossing over event, happens in prophase one. So, when the chromosomes break through the nucleus and they're released, they start to pair together as they work their way down to the equator to get to metaphase. While they're paired together, they can cross over like this. <coughs> Excuse me. We call this a synapsis or a crossing over event here. And what can happen is they can break and reform so that you get two new chromatids. Now, the important thing that to know about this, you have two chromosomes which are temporarily hooked together. We call that a bivalent. You have a crossing over event here. But who are the new chromatids that are forming? Well, if you look at this one on the outside, nothing has happened to it. It still looks just like the parental form. And if you look at this one over here on the right side, it also looks like the parental form. But these two, right, are going to be recombinants. So you get, from a crossover event, two parental types and two recombinant types. And here we can see here, they're crossing over. Now the location where they cross over is called the chiasma. And it breaks and then reforms so that you can see you've exchanged DNA. But... This one here on the left and this one here on the right are still parental types. Okay, this happens all in prophase one. They ask this all the time on the test and a lot of people accidentally put down metaphase one, prophase one. Okay, so now we have it taking place between non-sister chromatids in prophase one leading to recombination of alleles. So this means you could have new genetic possibilities because of recombination. Now, how rare is this event? Well, it's actually not all that rare. It's pretty frequent. Remember that the chromosomes are super duper big. <coughs> and not only can one take place, there could have been multiple recombinant events taking place all the time. So the possibilities get to be almost infinite of what we could end up with. Let's take a look here. Now, these are really good uh, electron microscope pictures here. And you can see right there, there's the chiasma. There's the bivalent chromosomes, and they're crossing over right there, right? So how many chiasma can we identify there? Well, it looks like there's one, there's two, three, four. By my eyes, there could be five recombinant events taking place there. Did I get it right? Oh, great. Fantastic. I got it right. Usually my eyes don't see these things. Okay. This increases the genetic variation through recombination. As we will discover later on next year, the likelihood of a recombinant event increases the further away that the genes are. And the chromosomes are very, very big. So most of these genes are pretty far apart. Now, some of them are not far apart. <coughs> As we'll discover, for example, hair color and eye color are pretty close together. And we'll learn next year that's why if you have blonde hair, the likelihood is you're going to have uh, blue eyes. Synapsis can only happen through homologous chromosomes. It cannot happen 
between the other pairs. So if we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, pair one lines up with one, two lines up with two, and so forth. They don't randomly line up. You can't change things that way. Okay, we get a chiasma forming right here. And then we get a recombination event. And you can see the alleles of the gene have changed. Now, we will discover later on in inheritance that there are many types of alleles for a particular gene. Oftentimes, there is a dominant allele and a recessive. Usually, dominants are indicated by the capital letter. So that might be the dominant form of gene E. That might be the recessive form there. Okay, let's see if we can put it all together here. So, we start off here with a wild type, right? Now, wild type means the parental. It means nothing has really happened. So, let's suppose you have two genes on there, D and E. This is dominant, dominant, recessive, recessive. This is recessive, recessive, dominant, dominant. What are the possibilities for gametes if there is no crossover event? Well, these would break apart, so you could only get two of these, big D and little e. And down here... You could only get two gametes, little d and big E. Those are the only possibilities you could get if no crossover event happened. But, but, if a crossover event does happen, you could have new possibilities. So on this one here, big D should be with little e. That's the wild type, parental type. But what if big D crosses over right here and it hooks up with big E? Then you get this guy. Okay, and the same thing could happen over here. You could cross over, big D could be with little e, and so forth. Now here you got the four gametes that you form. Now let's remember here, you always get four. Two of them will be the wild type parental, and two of them will be the recombinants. The wild type parental gametes look like the parents. So this one here looks like a parent, this one does not look like a parent, right? There's the parent, yes. This one, little, little, no, that doesn't look like the parent. And little, big, that does look like the parent. So this is the parental, this is recombinant, this is recombinant, and this is parental. Now, we will discover next year that the possibilities of having a recombinant form is less, significantly less, than having a parental type. So you'd probably have a lot more of the parental, this and this forming, than these two recombinant types. So now this happens in prophase one. Now we move down to metaphase one. The bivalents line up at the equator here, right? And as I said, you have a 50-50 chance of how they line up. The chromosome pairs, homologous pairs, have to line up, but it could be on either side. And that means the spindle could pull this one this way, the pink one this way, but it could have lined up the other way and the pink could have gone to the right and the blue could have gone to the left. Two times 23 possibilities. Wow, that's a lot. There's a 50-50 chance on how everything lines up there. So we also then get variation in metaphase one. So now we have two ways we can get variation. Now we go to anaphase one. The homologous pair separates, right? There will be no homologous pairs when we get to anaphase 2, but the sister chromatids still remain intact. Now, have we reduced the number of chromosomes? Yes, we have, because we've separated the pair. So if this was diploid, each new cell is only going to get one of these chromosomes. So in meiosis 1, we performed reductive division. And you can see here that these guys will move to opposite equators. This is a really nice picture of metaphase. Okay, let's look at what happens in metaphase two. I'm gonna go back there for a second. I think I skipped forward a little bit. Let's look at uh, metaphase two. Now in metaphase two, how can you tell the difference? Well, once again, the chromosomes line up on the equator here, but in metaphase two, there are no longer homologous chromosomes. You did reductive division. So they can't pair up with each other in bivalence. Instead, they all just line up here on the equator randomly. And there's no particular order that they line up. So there's one of each chromosome here. The spindle fibers attach to them, but how can you pull one chromosome in two different ways? You can't. So the only thing that can happen then is that the chromatin 
tids will separate because the centromere will break. So if I break this, then I can pull it either way. Now, am I reducing the number of chromosomes here? Not really, and I know this is confusing. But right now, since they're still attached, you have two chromosomes there. If you pull this one here and the pink one this, even though you have less DNA, the chromatid is considered to be a chromosome, so you have not changed the number of chromosomes. Have we added variation? No, we haven't because this cell that's going to form here will be exactly the same as this cell down here, right? These are the same. So it's really meiosis one where the interesting things sort of happen here. So now they separate out and you can see that this cell that's going to form will be exactly the same as this. This will be exactly the same as this. Now we reform the cells. Cytokinesis begins to take place in telophase two. We reform the nucleus and we split the cells. Reforming the nucleus, by the way, is not cytokinesis, right? Cytokinesis is where we break the cells. And you end up with one, two, three, four, four gamete cells. But you'll notice that they're not the same. So there was variation and that took place in meiosis one. Let's go ahead and do a quick check here of our language and see if we can wrap it up. What do we have here? This shows how many chromosomes. Looks like I only have two chromosomes. That's not right. Bivalent, yeah, they look the same. Non-disjunction, one pair. I'm going to go with bivalent on that. Yay, I got it right. How about this one here? Well, it's not two separate chromosomes. One pair of sister chromatids, that could be. I don't see a crossover event. Homologous chromosomes are bivalent. I think it's going to be the sister chromatids. How about this one? One, two chromosomes, <clears throat> two separate chromosomes, not a bivalent. No, no, no. It looks like it's going to be two separate. Yeah, oh, I'm doing really good on this. How about this one? How many chromosomes? One, two, three, four. We have two bivalents. Could be that one. Two homologous chromosomes. No, you have four homologous chromosomes. Looks like we have maybe two bivalents on there. Okay, let's review and finish up here. So, Prophase 1, metaphase 1, metaphase 2, variation is really taking place in meiosis 1. How does it take place? In prophase 1, you can have a crossover event. That can give us variation. And in metaphase 1, you could have a um, random orientation of which side of the equator the chromosomes line up on. We have reduction also taking place. In metaphase 2, the chromosomes simply line up all together because there are no longer any pairs on there. So which part of the process, meiosis 1, meiosis 2, produces the most genetic variation? It's going to be meiosis 1. Okay? Now, Mendel, he didn't know about DNA. We're going to talk about him when we start talking about inheritance, right? But Mendel went ahead and figured out how the genes separate by just looking at the results, okay? And he came up with two really important ideas that kind of match what we just learned. The first one, his first law, was the law of independent assortment. Independent assortment means there is a random chance of how the chromosomes could line up. Now, where does that take place? That would take place in metaphase one. So if you look on here, we can see that there is a random orientation that took place on the chromosomes. And that means that eventually when we get to meiosis 2, we would have different possibilities for the gametes.